Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Jeff. I'm an alcoholic. I was kind of looking forward to this. It's like the Backstreet Boys thing going on. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm grateful to be asked to share here. I didn't really put that much thought into it. Um, thankfully I've been too stressed out about something else going on and uh, I don't really believe in the whole script thing. So I'm just going to kind of go with it. Um, so let's see. My sobriety date is March 7th, um, 2018. So I just had one year. Which is, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm from Halfing Bay. I've lived in the East Bay for about 10 years. Um, so I started drinking pretty regularly when I was 14. Um, just going to, going to shows and hanging out with other punk rockers. Um, started playing in bands and stuff. And um, so I guess the high school years was the only time where it was really, I think my drinking was like normal and it wasn't totally a uh, complete physical uh, dependency type deal. Um, Let's see. Yes, that that was the time time period where it was kind of just... for fun and partying and maybe a little bit of self-medication. Um, and I'd say around when I was 18, I would start kind of, uh, doing a morning drink here and there. And, um, that's kind of around, uh, fast forward to, the band I was in, we got an opportunity to tour Europe which was probably the one of the coolest things I'd ever felt like I'd done. Um, and it's also when my alcoholism really got carried away, uh, full throttle. And I found myself hiding it from the band while we were driving, being in the back seat, trying to get my pregame on. And by the time I got back, I turned 20 out there. And when I got back, um, you still got to be 21 to drink in the U.S. And that's when I got like a fake ID and uh, the craving for alcohol was um, pretty constant. And I think more or less I was dealing with DT, like not hardcore DTs, but I had a physical uh, dependence going on for it. And, um, I think there, that's also a time I got in a car accident. Somebody, uh, bumped into my car and I ended up getting about $4,000 because it was uninsured, uh, motorists or whatever. And that's where I used the opportunity to really get carried away with Coke. And I'm pretty sure that half of the time is actually meth because it was keeping me up for a couple of days. Um, anyway, uh, that led to, uh, going, flying to Virginia and I was gonna, um, stay with some friends out there, ended up out here, met a girl in the East Bay, um, and this that was the first time I really experienced withdrawal, like alcohol withdrawal. And I drank um, pretty much all night before my birthday and hadn't drank anything the day of my birthday. And it was, I think, maybe like 15 hours without alcohol, which was the longest I had gone for a minute. And can't really explain it, but uh, just kind of felt like I was going to faint. Didn't feel right. Uh, my dad rushed me to the hospital, and that was at Highland. And they 
told me I had the liver damage or the beginning stages of liver damage and kept me in a three day medical detox. Um, and long, uh, that led, I ended up going to Newbridge, um, got a sponsor and I stayed sober for about three and a half years. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time, so I want to get to a little bit of positivity and recovery, but, um, I have a year, but I've been doing this on and off, uh, since 2010, um, uh, so the first time I relapsed, I rationalized it with, I went to Europe and I was with family and I rationalized that drinking wine, um, cool. was okay. And that worked for a decent amount of time until I started drinking liquor again. Um, got, you know, another year and a half sober. Uh, this last time was the scariest, um, and I ended up homeless. Um, I wasn't just around the clock drinker. It would be in between sleeping. I'd get up to use the bathroom and I would feel myself already shaken up. So when I would wake up to go to the bathroom, take two or three shots of vodka, a couple sips of water, go back to sleep, wake up, keep drinking, pass out. It was just literally needed um, to survive and, uh, uh, ended up in the ICU in a two week coma. My heart stopped and my organs were shutting down. And, um, it's been pretty undeniable for me to believe, to not believe, I believe in a higher power. It's hard for me to deny that. And, um, uh, pretty much I want to live today. I don't want to die. If I wanted to die, if I was suicidal, I would be drinking, but that's literally to drink is to die for me. And I'm a little too fucking young uh, for that. And, um, I'm in the outpatient program. I work with my sponsor. I'm doing the steps. Uh, I read with my first sponsor weekly. I have a commitment. Uh, my relationship with my family's done 180. Um, fuck, I, uh, I gained 50 pounds, which is pretty badass. I was 105 pounds when I was in the ICU. Uh, I use a lot of stuff I share, but I like so I'm gonna say it again. Uh, to, uh, live fast and die young is all fun and games until you're actually dying. Um, so yeah, man, I don't know. I'm happy to be alive. And uh this program definitely works and I'm I've experienced the promises. I thought it was all a bunch of fairy tale bullshit at first. And um I've definitely experienced the promises and I've definitely experienced a really good connection with my higher power. So that's what I got. Thank you. Uh, my name's Rebecca, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, happy birthday to those celebrating days. 50-something days is fucking huge. A year, 60 days is huge. Every day, every day sober is huge. Um, I was sitting here and had something in my eye and rubbed my eye with this hand and was like, oh, yeah, you were peeling and chopping jalapeno. <laughs> you only oh, use no. soap and water instead of pouring oh. vinegar on your hand. So then I went with this hand, and I had it on this hand, too. So if I start squinting and all that. That's just a little explanation as to why. Um, I'm going to stand up off and on just because uh, I always have to pee right when I'm going to share. And it's easier to stand up and hold the urine than it is to sit. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, just to start, kind of qualify um, my sobriety date from drugs and alcohol is uh, June 8th, 2006. Um, 
I was just saying this morning, like, to my partner, I'm like, I can't fucking believe I haven't drank. You know, I can't believe that I've actually been living and functioning and walking through life and not having a drink. That is a fucking miracle. And then so many other things after that, right? That I'm not suicidal like I was for most of my life. Like, don't have crippling anxiety anymore. I don't have, like, this debilitative depression. Um, And the psych meds I take actually work, right? Because I'm not drinking a lot of rum with them. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, this stuff isn't working. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start with a reading here just to kind of ground myself in um, the literature. And this is like, um, this is becoming one of my favorite passages in the big book is The Doctor's Opinion. And um, I have like the immense privilege to be working with 10 uh, sponsees right now. And So I've gotten to read this passage a lot recently. And I'm just, every stuff comes to me new every time. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah, that too. Um, So this is just three paragraphs here. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented. And unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Right? The whole world gets to drink but me. Mm-hmm. After they have succumbed to desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with the firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change. There is very little hope of their recovery. On the other hand, and strangers this may seem to those who do not understand, Once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems they despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control their desire for alcohol, the only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. Um, And I love that passage, and I was reading it recently with somebody on Thursday with the context of saying that, like, yeah, my sponsee had, has seven years, you know, I have 12 and a half, and I was saying, like, yeah, so this obsession or impulsive thinking about substances, for me it was cocaine and rum and massive quantities of marijuana, um, I, that's not really at the forefront of my mind anymore. I don't think about that stuff. Most of the time, I go out to places and I'm like, oh, yeah, you have your wine. I'm kind of paying attention to how you're drinking it, but I'm not overwhelmed to the sense of, like, I have to run out of there. But the way that this applies to me now is I can insert alcohol. I can take out alcohol and insert my thinking. I can insert relationships. I can insert driving. I can insert money management. I can insert self-obsession. Um, I can insert mental health issues, and it makes exactly the same sense. Because my natural state is this restless, irritable, and discontentedness. You know, like, I can't tell you how many days I wake up, and I'm just irritated. And I'm walking out the door, and I'm like, Mom, motherfucker. Or I'm like, you know, driving, and I'm like, cussing in Spanish at people, you know, and... um, it speaks to the fact uh, of why I have, like, a morning ritual, right, to, like, ground myself and touch down and remind myself who I am. Like, I enjoy saying my name is Rebecca and I'm an alcoholic because what it means for me now without laughing or saying jokes about it afterwards is that, like, I am rooted in a solution because there's no cure 
for this disease that I have, right? But there's so many different solutions, and there's so many ways to come at that solution. And it could be just me taking a moment and taking five deep breaths, you know, or for me, a lot of it is movement, you know, so I do some body rolls and, you know, work out some kinks in my, in my lower back, you know, roll my feet out on a tennis ball and just take some moments to just like feel my heart beating. And now that is what gives me ease and comfort. Those things, like this connection, that for me is a connection to my higher power. That for me is a connection to something outside of the mind. Um, and I, I've gotten to and had to over and over again in sobriety need to effect an entire psychic change around different behaviors and relationships and whatever comes up for me, you know, as, as a human being living on planet Earth, you know, on a planet that's probably just as diseased as I am, you know, and just as sick as I am. Um, and sometimes those psychic changes have come about, like me being, needing to be really, really willing to work with others. Like the fact that I get to work with so many sponsees right now, it only speaks to the fact that I need that much help. <laughs> You know, that I get to take this opportunity to, like, read people's inventories on a daily basis and meet with them and respond to their phone calls and respond in the same way that my sponsor responds to me, you know, because she is mirroring and teaching me what what I want to teach to others, you know. So I just wanted to read that uh because that's really speaking to me right now. And just to clarify for myself that I am not experiencing craving of substances or other problems that I have unless I engage in that behavior, right? So unless I'm actually drinking or snorting or smoking um, or for me engaging in self-harm, which is what I did way before I picked up the drugs and the alcohol, I am not experiencing a craving, right? I'm just experiencing compulsions or obsessive mind. And that that's helpful for me to remember that. That like even, you know, when I was new, you know, I got I got sober at a Henry Olaf house, the Skip Byron program. It's a big recovery program in San Francisco. And um we would always be, you know, we're in this fun house, like this house of mirrors. I'm living in this house with like 20 other women that are just as out of their minds as I am, you know. And so we talk a lot. It's like, oh, I'm having cravings today. Or we talk to other people that have the same amount of time as us and having cravings. And what I didn't know at that time was I actually was not having cravings. I was just having the mind of an alcoholic, right? When something stresses me out, makes me extra happy, I'm bored, I'm pissed off, whatever, I would think about the drink. I would think about whatever substance it was that gave me that ease and comfort or that took me out of that moment, you know, and I wasn't craving. I was just doing what the mind does. And I learned that, like, every human mind does that, alcoholic or not, but I have this little edge to it, and that edge is that I have a mind that has a disease that is progressive and fatal, Right? So my mind can kill me if I don't treat it. Right? So this is like my dialysis, my daily shot of vitamin B, whatever, you know. My movement, my breath, my prayer, meditation, reading the morning readings, you know, all that. Um, so uh, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Born in San Francisco from here, yeah, um, not native, because I'm not Ohlone, but I am a local, um, uh, grew up also in Santa Cruz, and, um, my parents separated when I was really young, I come from, um, like, a mixed background, and, um, two very strong cultures, languages, and religions, 
And I did not, you know, growing up in the 70s, I did not fit in. My father is um, Lithuanian, Latvian, Jewish. My mother's from Mexico. So there were no Mexi Jews to be had when I was coming up. <laughs> right? So now there's some. But, you know, that uh, that idea of, like, always want, like wanting to fit in and be a part of it, to feel okay about me, was real from a young age. And... Um, when I was five, I uh, experienced some severe ass trauma that no five year old should have to experience. As a result of outside help, therapy, and doing these 12 steps over and over again with my sponsor, different sponsors over the years, you know, I've gotten to give that experience the importance that it has, how it really colored the rest of my life, you know? Like, why do I respond to men in certain ways like this? You know, why am I so aggressive? Why do I want a table tip when I see, uh, you know, a rape scene or, you know, a scene where somebody's being abused, you know? Um, and that's been really powerful because what that's done for me is to get to, like, soothe myself, you know, to give myself, again, that ease and comfort, like, it's okay, you know? to not feel like I'm so controlled by what's up here. Uh, so anyway, I experienced that at five. My parents got divorced when I was like seven. Um, and that's all it took for me as a hypersensitive being born into the world. That's all it took, you know? Um, I used to say in early sobriety that I was born an alcoholic. I don't know that. I don't know shit, right? I'm just talking up here. So what I really think is that I was born beautiful, radiant, right? Perfection, like we all are, right? Just as we're supposed to be when we come out. And um, over time, different experiences, um, okay. Uh, yeah, those, different, those, those two major things that I experienced shaped the way I responded to myself and to the world, right? So I started harming myself. Um, and uh, I started doing something which, at the time, nobody knew anything about. The, keep in mind that there was no internet, right? We're all landlines, no computers. We're playing Pong on these, like, 70-pound <laughs> blocks that are on desks. They were called computers. Um, and so my parents were like, what the fuck do we do with her? You know? So I got punished because they didn't know what to do. So, um, each parent had their own way of doing that. And so the idea of hiding and being secret and knowing how to leave my, leave my body, like disassociate, just like drugs and alcohol did for me. Like, oh, I'm feeling this way. I don't like it. Uh, that notion came to me really early, and I started doing that kind of behavior at, like, seven years old. So for me, I feel like I've been using since I was seven, really. Um, because I had this self-harming behavior, um, I didn't really get into drugs and alcohol, like, really put in work into, like, doing alcoholic, drug addict behavior until I was in my mid-20s. You know, the first time I got drunk, high school very much looked like my last drunk, which was like my first drunk, felt sorry for myself, I was at home, mixed a bunch of junk together, drank it, blacked out, woke up to throw up on myself, and blacked out again. That's kind of how it looked like at the end. Um, I was like, okay, that was lame, you know? Um still had my self-harming stuff, you know, to kind of like kept me from, kept me feeling very different too, you know, growing up, I was constantly getting, you know, like, what are you? And people were referring to my ethnic background where I grew up. It was mm -hmm. Santa Cruz at that time when I was younger, it was super segregated and, um, not a lot of mixed people. And so if you were Mexican, you didn't look a certain way. You were a coconut. Brown on the outside, white on the inside. Which I happen to love coconuts, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So all that stuff, like I just internalized it all, you know, I internalized all of that stuff being so sensitive and I had no tools to deal with it. Right. Um, I come from a very loving household, but you know, my parents are human beings, meaning, meaning they're dysfunctional, like every other human being on the planet. Right. Um, and so they did the best they could and, um, not really communicating to each other. Uh, I, I, they're both educators. My parents, my father's been a teacher since I was born, a lot of public school teacher and my mom, university professor. And, um, and so I just thought, oh, well, I'll do that too. You know, like I really admire what they do and they have like community and they have like students around them and, um, my mom's like super political. So I got politicized really, really young. Um, and all that was like, I liked it, you know, it appealed to me. And so I went from high school, um, into right into university, you know, not that I like had a great dedication to school or anything. Um, my whole life was her like, well, she only applied herself, you know? And so, um, yeah, not a lot of things were followed through on. I got super, I would get super obsessed with like relationships and stuff. So <clears throat> I know that I had that potential inside of me to do much more on the, um, in the, in the air, in the arena of like being an alcoholic or an addict. Uh, just my behavior. Um, when I went to university, I say the one, the one takeaway that I got that I was like most proud of was that I was able to reclaim and my native tongue, native colonizer's tongue, whatever. So like, you know, being Chicana, like I didn't speak fluent Spanish growing up and that was a big, big source of shame for a lot of Chicanos it is, you know, cause like parents won't necessarily teach you cause they don't want you to experience the same kind of racism they experience, uh, especially, you know, if you're like first or second generation. So, uh, yeah, I studied Spanish linguistics and I got to go live in Mexico for a year. And, that whole year, I didn't know self coming. Okay, I just am like getting tripped out by that thing. <laughs> um, I didn't know self harming while I was away, which was super interesting. And I didn't, I didn't use like crazy either. You know, the doctor's opinion talks about these different stages of of alcoholism, right? Or growing into an alcoholic, right? So, like a heavy drinker is not an alcoholic. They can stop. They don't haven't developed that allergy yet. And I really had to work hard to develop that allergy. Because like I said, I had this other coping mechanism. Um, and it just was like a downward spiral. Uh, made some bad decisions around relationships. Got into an abusive one, the first one ever. And uh, got a teaching job after I graduated. I say that because I just walked. I didn't, I hadn't finished like three classes. Um, so that was like a should hanging over me, you know, like you should have done this, you should have done that, you should have done the other. People really know who you are. They're going to think you're a fuck up. They're going to think you're this. You're going to think you're a freak, blah, blah, blah. So um, got a teaching job though because I lied. And um, just decided at one point, like, I, I'm, I don't want to go into work today. And then that day turned into two, three, four, five days. And I didn't do any prep for the substitutes. And that's all it took. That's all it took was this little tiny micro permission that I gave myself. And um, started smoking cigarettes. Cigarettes were my gateway drug. <laughs> and I started smoking cigarettes, hiding, because my family smokes copious amounts of weed, but cigarettes are a no, no. Um, that's the man's way of poisoning us. So I was hiding, doing that, and that also kind of added, like, another weight, you know, to this suitcase I was carrying around. Um... 
lost my place, lost my job, moved back in with my mom, started stealing her liquor. Liquor was never a thing for me, you know? But when I was living in Mexico, I traveled to Cuba, and I got really good at drinking rum, straight from the bottle. So I decided that that was going to be my thing, and, uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I decided that was going to be my thing, and so it became my thing. And uh, started stealing. That was another big thing for me because I would never get profiled. My brothers would get profiled all the time. I could get away with anything uh, until I couldn't, but uh, that's later on. So, yeah, I became. I started becoming a daily drinker um, when I was, like, 27, and it really only took me, just like it talks about in the big book, there's this tiny little paragraph talking about women alcoholics and how really only takes us, we can go from zero to a thousand in like a five-year time span. And that's exactly what happened for me. Like once I developed this, another thing I did was, so the self-harming that I had is called trichotillomania, which is compulsive hair pulling. Um, and so I decided the hair was the problem, so I was shave my head, right? Hair's the problem, shave the head, you're all good. That's when I became, like, I need something else. I need something, you know? That's when the rum became a daily with cigarettes and a lot of herb. And honestly, I think my parents aren't addicts or alcoholics. I have uncles on my dad's side who are, my grandfather on my mom's side. So there wasn't really, like, any like, watch out for that kind of thing going on. Um, and I got pretty much code. Like, my parents kind of code me. Like, they would help me out way too much. That was the only reason I wasn't homeless. Because at this point, I couldn't hold a job as a working at a cafe. I circled through all the businesses in the Laurel District. I worked at Ace Hardware. I worked at Full House Cafe when it was before Sequoia. I worked at Valero Gas Station. I worked at Full Ground. I worked at a uh, World Ground Cafe. I could not hold any of those jobs because they got in the way of my ease and comfort. Uh, and I did most of my using alone. I did most of my using at home alone in my kitchen. I thought I was being really economical, and I didn't have to share. And more than that, because I was like the only addict and alcoholic in my circle, people would bug the fuck out if they found out the way that I drank. You know, it was like 6 a.m., me and Amy Goodman, Democracy Now!, <laughs> coffee's brewed, rum's on the table, let's go. Let me just punish myself and pummel myself for all the things I'm not doing that I should have done, all these social justice movements that, like, I could be a part of, you know, community work. I could be a part of that I'm not doing, you know. And then, of course, like, the fantasy. The fantasy was just wild. Like, I was going to do this, and I was going to do that, and then I would black out, you know. And then uh, I would do, I developed what I call bulimic alcoholism, which I make myself throw up so that I could keep doing it, you know. Uh, anyway, speed up, got into cocaine. That was, that, thank God for cocaine, y'all. It brought me in here so fast. Like, the first time I tried it, I was down on my hands and knees looking for white specks on the floor, on a white linoleum floor. Um, and even my cocaine dealer was like, Mija, you're a good girl. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, what? I don't need to hear this, you know? Within six months, you know, I... My family did their version of an intervention. Um, I went to pick up my nephew from daycare, or the woman that was watching him. He was nine months old at the time. I hadn't drank that day, but I was probably, like, vaporizing rum, you know? Because it's like, I'm not that big, and my metabolism's, like, fast, so I probably was just, like, you know, it was coming off me in waves. She wouldn't give him to me. You know, I found out later, she only watched my nephew for two week time span, and she was an adult child of an alcoholic. So somehow during that time, I was asked to go pick him up in that tiny two weeks, 
She would have given him to me. She finally gave him to me, told my sister-in-law, right? And my sister-in-law sat me down and was like, Rebe, I do not feel comfortable with you driving with Omar anymore. I actually don't feel comfortable with you being here alone in the room with him anymore. And that was their version of like an intervention. Um, and it was really gentle and it was really loving and soft. And it was kind of like this feather that landed on me and I just broke into a million pieces. I was like, they, I'm naked. They see me. They know what I'm doing. Because I thought I was doing a pretty good job. So it's like hilarious, you know, I'm totally bloated, like I always drink, I always stink like alcohol, I can't hold a job, you know, I'm like depressed, I'm crying all the time, I'm talking openly about suicide, um, <laughs> anyway, um, so my other mom, I was raised by two moms after my parents were divorced, gave me a card, she was like, call, go. That's all she said. It said, Henry Olaf House Alcohol Addiction Recovery Programs. I was like, how dare you? you know? <laughs> um, but I called. I called because at that moment in my dramatic form, I felt like Jesus on the cross. This is how I imagined myself. Like, oh my God, I'm suffering and I'm naked and everyone can see me. And I had nothing else to do. I was like, I'm either going to drink myself to death because that's kind of where it was headed, or I'm going to call this number. And I called, and they're like, yeah, we got a spot for you. It was a Tuesday that I called, and we got a spot for you come in on Thursday. And I'm like, oh, don't you have anything like Monday? I got a big weekend planned, you know, <laughs> sitting alone in my kitchen. <laughs> um, so I went. I went on that Thursday, June 8th. Um, that was my first day sober from drugs and alcohol. And um, I did their 30-day spin dry, and then I lived in the women's house. Uh, the women's recovery program that was there it doesn't exist anymore, but it was an amazing program um, for nine months. And I learned how to do things over again. I learned how to uh, brush my teeth, <laughs> floss my teeth, make my bed, shower, wash clothes, eat three meals a day, interact with other people, um, consider other people's feelings, uh, admit my alcoholism, admit that I was powerless over alcohol, and that my life was totally and completely unmanageable. When I tried to manage my drink, which I never tried, you know, what I did identify with was trying to manage my self-harming. Because I'd been trying to do that since I was seven. Since I got the first reaction from an adult that was like, what's wrong with you? You know? And I didn't know. I couldn't answer. So I'd be in front of the mirror promising myself. I promise, I promise I won't do it today. Not knowing, you know, <laughs> that I had this, like, phenomenon of craving already developed in me. And my only way to cope was that way. You know? My only way to be was that way. Um, and when I came into recovery, I had my head shaved again. So that's how, like, my folks from my first home group know me. Each day, new beginning, 7 a.m., Monday through Friday, on church and market. If you ever are over in the city early in the morning, it's an amazing meeting. And um, those gay boys saved my life. They really did. I felt really comfortable being in queer meetings. Um, just with my, you know, my family having grown up in a queer family and, um, that's where I stayed for two years and then I moved back to the East Bay. But like right away in that program, I was competing with the other women. They're like, get a sponsor. Got it. Mm -hmm. You know, work the first three steps. Done. <laughs> you know, it's like, I was going to win, you know, I was going to win at recovery and, um, but that, that helped, and I would come to the meeting just so that they would comment on my outfits, you know? But, like, whatever, whatever gets you there, you know, checking people out, showing off your shoe gang, like, <laughs> the coffee, because I was in a recovery program, they didn't serve coffee, so I'd be at the meetings, like, you know, <laughs> getting really high on coffee. Um, I'm eternally grateful to that, to that program. And then I got to go to my first AA meeting. You know, we did all the A's in that program. I got to check out all of the anonymouses. 
And even though I qualified for a lot of them, I really got my medicine, my soul medicine in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and that's where I've stayed. Um, not by me. I'm not some like extraordinary alcohol, sober alcoholic, you know, it's total fucking grace. The fact that I remain desperate, that I have all these character defects, my humanity, right. Um, that keep me so close to inventories and working the steps and prayer and practicing spiritual principles with myself first, you know, like compassion for myself, forgiveness for myself. Um, and that's, that's what keeps me here. You know, I know really well that if I go to less than three meetings a week, it is not a good look. I will get in some shit. I will start some shit. You know, I've had, I probably created more what we call wreckage or messes sober than I did in my using because I did all my using by myself. Yeah, I harmed myself tremendously and that harmed everyone that loved me, right? Like I didn't realize that people that loved me were hurt because I was self-harming. That never occurred to me at all. And I only finally digested that after like five years sober. I was like, my head popped out of my ass at that moment. You know, like, oh my God. Wow. Like I affect people. I matter in the world, you know, because when I came into AA, it was like the queen baby complex. You know, I'm either totally better than you or I'm the biggest piece of shit that the world revolves around, you know, and amazingly, I'm a little somewhere in the middle now, you know, like I'm not quite so much. The most amazing thing is that I experience like time minutes knitted together that work up into hours that become a day, maybe two or three days in a row where I will feel totally serene and not have a verbal or physical confrontation with anybody and not do something or, that I feel really shitty about, and I, maybe I won't even tell a lie, you know? Or I'll do something, and I'll be able to, I'll have a messed up response to myself, but then the way that I respond to that response will be really compassionate and loving. I'll be like, oh, yeah, what are you feeling insecure about? What are you feeling fear about? What are you afraid of, you know? So... That is um, one thing I will say in a very passive-aggressive way that my first sponsor <laughs> taught me was meetings are an opportunity for me to practice being still. I didn't know what that was, like paying attention, like for myself, the grace of like not fucking with my phone for one hour, 60 minutes, you know, and I've fallen back on that in the past few years. But try it. I mean, just try it. Give yourself one meeting. And you know what? This is going to be the meeting where I do that, you know, if you tend to be on your phone. But I also had to bring my knitting or my drawing instead, you know, because the anxiety is real, right? Social situation. I'm not comfortable in my skin yet. But, um, yeah, I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous is the only thing that has worked for me. And so I'm staying one day at a time, sometimes one hour at a time, um, not because the cravings or the uh, obsession for drugs and alcohol is there, because I just get overwhelmed with being human, you know? It's not easy being human. It's not easy being alive. And it's also, like, that is, like, a recipe for a gratitude list, right? I just get to go, wow, I'm so grateful to have, like, two feet with really dexterous toes, you know? Um, and to be working in a career that I love, like I was born to do what I'm doing. And um, the fact that I'm actually driving Uber and Lyft part-time, when I can't tell you how many road rage incidents I have been at, <laughs> where police were involved, sober, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's not about being perfect. It's about just abstaining one hour at a time from substances and just breathing through the stuff, you know? Just breathing through it. 
and taking responsibility for myself and my feelings and my actions. Um, so, yeah, it's been really great to get to share with you my love for Alcoholics Anonymous and the fact that I'm still alive today and, uh, and that I actually make a positive effect in the world today. You know, that I'm, I'm not hurting myself or other people like I used to is just a testament to these steps, you know, um, the traditions. And all of us that come together that show up, whether we have 24 hours or 11 days, nine months, a year, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.